Okay, so hello everyone and thanks for joining us for what promises I think to be a really special evening. So uh, I think that probably many of you will have been to events or talks about poetry before, um, but my guess is that few of you uh, will have been to events or talks about poetry that have been hosted by physicists. So the first thing I want to do is to, to sort of reassure you that this is actually happening. Uh, it's not just a sort of funny dream that's been uh, brought about by spending too much time on Zoom. Uh, and I'll also explain a little bit about the project that has brought all of this about. Now, as a physicist, I feel really privileged to spend my professional life here at Magdalen not just around great physicists uh, and other scientists, but also surrounded by great historians, linguists, medics, lawyers, uh, scholars of literature, etc. you name it. And the Magdalen community extends, of course, way beyond the limits of the people who are within its walls at any particular moment in time. It's a, it's a huge international family of folks who have studied or worked here and then gone on to contribute to every possible um, area of human uh, existence that you can imagine. And today's webinar is really an illustration of the exciting things that can happen when people with different skills and shared interests, shared passions, get together. Now today, the 23rd of February, marks 200 years since the poet uh, John Keats passed away at the age of just 25 in Rome. Now, Keats left behind a corpus of poetry of extraordinary significance, a, a body of work that really played a defining role in the development of what came to be known as the English Romantic Movement. But he's also a human being, a son, a brother, a surgeon, a man whose bibliography reads like a, a catalogue of personal tragedies and someone who, though he's now widely celebrated, really struggled in life to gain acceptance or recognition. And we here, uh, a big group of us from scientists to statesmen, as part of a project headed by the Institute for Digital Archaeology in collaboration with the Keats Shelley Memorial Association to explore the legacy of John Keats from a whole range of different angles. Now, a few housekeeping things to begin with. We are going to have a Q&A session um, at, the end of the, at the end of the seminar. Please, as we go along, uh, use the Q&A box to put in any questions and we will field those at the end. Um, but first of all, um, before, we do, uh, before, we, before we get to those questions, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Roger Michael, who is going to introduce the project properly, the whole broad project that we're a part of, as well as our guests and contributors. Uh, so Roger, over to you. Dr. Karanowska, thank you so much for the, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I have to say, I've always been fascinated by the, uh, by the sound of poetry, uh, ever since I was a, a, a baby Anglo-Saxonist here under the, 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 uh, the wing of Eric Stanley at Oxford, um, to, to more recently, I, I, I translated Beowulf into Maori. Um, I have to say that project was very instructive. Even though the Maori poets who advised us uh, didn't know a word of Old English, uh, they still got the emotional message of Beowulf uh, from the sounds and the cadences uh, of, of the language. Uh, and it was fascinating to watch. As uh, we, we, have a, we have a poet laureate with us here tonight, Simon Armitage. The US also has a poet laureate. Uh, a recent poet laureate was a fellow called Robert Pinsky, who was one of my former colleagues at Boston University. And he said once that a sentence let me get this right. A sentence is like a tune. A really good sentence gives you the emotion. It expresses a melodic shape. You want to hear it again. You want to hum it to yourself. And he's absolutely right. Sound is essential uh, to poetry. And in fact, people have long understood the necessity of, of, of hearing and not just reading uh, poetry. It's no, uh, it's no accident that, uh, that, that, that so many of the iconic poems in the Western canon, things like the Odyssey and the Iliad, and the Aeneid, all of those come out of a, an oral tradition. And so when, uh, so about a year ago, Sir Ivor Roberts, who runs the Keats Shelley Memorial Association, he asked me for help uh, in finding ways to celebrate the bicentennial of Keats' death. It popped into my head that we should, we should try to find a way to rediscover the authentic sound of Mr. Keats' uh, poetry. How did it sound inside the head of, 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 this, of this great poet? Uh, anybody who's ever heard 
uh, you know, the Bach suites, let's say the French suites, the English suites, which were written for harpsichord, played on a piano, you understand how depriving even that's such beautiful music, but even that great music uh, loses its emotional impact when it doesn't have its intended voice. And, uh, and, and, and it's so too with poetry, absolutely the same. For me, Keats was always a, a, a blue chip name that I wanted to like. He was this, this iconic English poet. Um, but I have to say the words, Keats words really only began to sing for me when in the context of this project, I began to hear a lot of Keats read aloud. Um, it, it's poetry, maybe his poetry, but maybe it's like all poetry, it's meant to be heard. And so tonight you're gonna hear the poetry of Keats read by a huge range of voices from all over the UK. We may even step outside of the UK uh, and take a trip to Nashville to see what Keats uh, looks like from the outside looking in. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, and then we'll conclude with a recreation of John Keats uh, reading his very last poem in the, in the very room in Rome at the bottom of the Spanish steps. You've all walked by it. If you've been to Rome on the left-hand side of the stairwell, that's the house where Keats died. And we're gonna go to the very room where he passed away. And in that room, uh, our CGI Mr. Keats will, uh, will read his, his poem, Bright Star, his last poem. Um, and it'll be, I'll be curious to see what people think. Uh, for me, uh, when I, and I should say, and, and we'll hear a lot more from, from Mr. Sen and from Dr. Karanovska about, uh, about how uh, this, this voice was recreated. And, and Dr. Sen, I should say, um, uh, worked with us to do a really meticulous job of, of recreating. It's, it's a kind of linguistic archeology span that he helped us with, but we've, we've gone to, to, to really great lengths with his assistance to produce an accurate depiction of that, that voice, a voice for which he, by the way, was pillory during his lifetime. He was the Cockney poet, and, and that was meant as a disparagement, not just of his voice, but of his talent. Um, and, and it's very interesting to me that that, that early Cockney, it's nothing like the Cockney that you're gonna, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Sen, nothing like the Cockney we know today in the 21st century, uh, but, uh, but, but it's, it's, it, it, is, it is the voice of John Keats. And when I heard his poetry read in that voice, like I say, it all snapped into focus for me. But as we go along tonight, we're gonna hear, as I say, lots of different voices, lots of different accents. Think about how the sound of the poetry uh, informs uh, your, your appreciation of, of the words. Um, uh, Dr. Karanowska, would it be okay if we if we if we jumped right into a poem just to kind of get things moving here before we had any more uh, chat? I'd, I'd love to. I, I think it would be great. I think it would be great to get us in the mood. <laughs> okay, good. Then, uh, well, I, then I promise I'll turn things over to uh, uh, to, to Dr. Karanowska and to Scarlett Sibet, who's one of our poets. I'll say a little bit more a little bit more about her in a second, uh, and they'll be your 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 much more uh, capable co-hosts uh, for the evening. But. Um, but let me just say something about the, what you're going to hear. I, I talked about appreciating the sound of poetry. My friend uh, Ian Harvey, uh, and, and many of you uh, may know him from his, his incredible work with Delamitri, so many great tunes over the years, um, so many interesting songs, happy songs. I, I love, I love Delamitri's music, but Ian, uh, wonderful talent. His, his voice is just incredible. Great Glaswegian accent. And what I should say about that is that uh, I mean, apart from the fact that I think it just suits the poetry, the atmosphere of the poetry so perfectly, and indeed, uh, uh, it's, it's certainly his accent is apropos to this particular work of Keats, which is a poem he composed upon seeing the grave of Robert Burns. Um, but what's interesting is, and again, Dr. Sen will have more to say about this, but Keats' own accent in London uh, in the, in the, at the turn of the 19th century would, would sound, would have sounded very much like, a, 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 to, to our modern ears, a Northern accent. So, so Ian's accent is very much in the idiom of the accent that, Keith would have, that, that Keats himself uh, would have channeled when, when composing these pieces. In any event, I think it is just a, a beautiful song, really, and uh, at least in Ian's mouth it is. So with no further ado, let's, let's hear some poetry. This is Ian Harvey uh, 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 reciting uh, Keith upon seeing the uh, the grave of Robert Burns. Dr. Karanowska, please. The town, the churchyard and the setting sun, the clouds, the trees, the rounded hills all seem though beautiful, cold, strange. As in a dream I dreamed long ago, now new begun. The short-lived paley summer is but one from winter's ague for one hour's gleam. Through sapphire warm, their stars do never beam. With all this cold beauty, pain is never done. 
for who is mind to relish minus wise the real of beauty free from that dead hue sickly imagination and sick pride cast wan upon it burns with honour due I oft have honoured thee great shadow hide thy face I sin against thy native skies just beautiful uh, anyway uh, as I said, I would uh, be introducing Scarlett Sibet. Scarlett Sibet, an amazing uh, a, a British poet, uh, a, a, a author of three or four anthologies, uh, has been one of the, uh, the, the members of this uh, little band right from the beginning, uh, along with our, our, our poet laureate, uh, uh, Simon Armitage. Uh, uh, Scarlett was commissioned to produce a, a piece of poetry for the Bicentennial. Uh, she and, and, and Mr. Armitage have both uh, perform that, their appointed tasks, and we'll be hearing uh, both of those uh, commission poems uh, tonight. Uh, I think I think Scarlett may have uh, something else uh, to offer on, on the, uh, uh, in terms of, of, of reciting Mr. Keith's poetry uh, for us as well. As I mentioned, we'll be hearing Bright Star at the end in the voice of Mr. Keats. Um, I thought it would be interesting if, if Scarlett would, would oblige to hear Bright Star uh, read by her. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that happens, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Scarlett and to Alexi, and, uh, and like I say, they'll be your the host for the balance of the, uh, for the event. Thank you all very much for coming, and thank you to all of our poets for producing such beautiful work. Thank you to Mr. Keats, wherever you are. We hope you enjoy your, your, your day back on Earth. His, his tombstone, by the way, gave him an extra day. He died on the 23rd. His tombstone, as many folks may know, was, mis or, you know, was misinscribed, says the 24th, so we're giving him back that extra day uh, today. I hope he enjoys it. Anyway, Scarlett, uh, Dr. Alexi, please uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Roger. Hi, Scarlett. Hi. Hi. So I thought what we might do actually is uh, is kick off with another uh, introduction. Uh, so Dr. Sen um, has been absolutely instrumental in uh, what is possibly the most fascinating part of this project. Um, so he has been working with us on the reconstruction of uh, the, the voice of John Keats. Yeah. Um, and it, it's been a sort of a project of uh, historical detective work of a kind that it will perhaps be a little bit unusual to, you know, we're, we're used to, we understand archaeology, you know, going out there and digging things out of the ground. But uh, this is something a little bit different. So I don't know, Ranjan, would you like to, uh, to kick off with a little bit of an explanation about your, your contribution to the project? Thanks for the introduction, Alexi. Yes, um, uh, I mean this this event is uh, is called bringing Keats brackets back to life, and uh, um, I think it would be insulting to suggest that the the poetry on the page isn't alive itself. So, what what, what do those brackets mean? Um, and as the pronunciation guy on the project, I don't want to suggest that uh, <laughs> this is what's bringing Keats to life in any way. But um, I suppose what we're trying to do is when we consider. Um, viewing a great work of art or or reading a great poem or you know, seeing the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, it's, it's breathtaking and beautiful. I think what we're trying to recreate is, is something like um, uh, what the Sistine Chapel would have looked like the day after it was painted with the vibrant colours uh, and the breathtaking uh, result of, of, this, of this work. And, and through that, um, trying to get to what the poetry would have meant to Keats himself in the way he himself would have spoken it. As, as Roger was talking about, um, the hallmark of poetry um, is, is sort of conveying meaning and, and, and beyond through its sound, through the, the resonance of the vowels and there's sort of percussive plosives and lilting liquids. Um, and and I think re reconstructing that to uh, sort of brings everything together uh, to create this new this experience and understanding. One other thing that Roger was talking about was um, about uh, in a, about speech and um, how listening to the poetry read aloud really really brought it to life for, for him. Um, and for others, it may be simply reading it will do that. I mean, psycholinguistic studies and psychology language studies have, have, have suggested that um, inner speech is real. Um, we can't su suppress silent reading. We, we read words on the page and there is a bit of phonology. There's a bit of sound reconstruction going on, even in silent reading. And this is sort of one of the main, one of the main reasons why it's, it's important to, to, to sort of bring that to fruition and, and really think about what the sounds are. Um, 
So I mean, that's the why of the project. I, I can talk a little bit about the how if if you like now as well, or would you like me? That to would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Well, as you said, it was it was a bit of linguistic detective work in following the the breadcrumbs. Some breadcrumbs are larger than others. The first breadcrumb is more like a, a three course meal, um, given that uh, the the late eighteenth century and early nineteenth century is the the heyday of of producing pronouncing dictionaries and elocution manuals. And this was a period in British history where how you spoke really became bound up with, with your, your identity and your social class and your perceived social class. Um, and so people were often instructed to, to, to use proper diction. If anyone's familiar with uh, Blackadder and the third series of Blackadder, there's the wonderful episode where Prince George played by Hugh Laurie is, uh, is taught by two actors how to, uh, <laughs> how to um, uh, give a speech using proper diction of the day. And that's a, that's a parody on one of the main interests of the time. So we have a wealth of information there, not only from the, the 18th century, late 18th century, but, but also the early 19th century. And if the 18th century is probably the century of, of, of do's and pronouncing dictionaries, how to pronounce things, then the 19th century is possibly the century of don'ts, uh, how, how to avoid vulgarities and improprieties. Um, and so uh, works in the early early 19th century by people like S Smart and Batchelor give us a lot of information um, as to how a Londoner with not too broad a London accent would have would have spoken in that day. And so that gives us our first word in the poem, bright star. <laughs> we have the word bright, not spoken as in bright in our modern day RP, but a bit more like bright, bright, as we'll hear later, which may sound a little bit West Country to you. Um, so you, using this as the starting point, and uh, we, I sort of have to thank colleagues at the University of Poitiers for, for making available a wonderful digitized version of um, an edition of Walker's Pronouncing Dictionary um, from 1809, um, which, which is a dictionary that cast a massive shadow over the whole of the 19th century with about 40 editions, roaring trade in this dictionary. So the question then is, did Keats speak in these prescribed ways or or not. And then we, we're led to our second clue in that, uh, as Roger mentioned, um, his poetry, his work was denounced in his day as, uh, as Cockney poetry. And uh, he was a member of the Cockney school by uh, respected periodicals of the day, the Quarterly Review and, and Blackwoods. That suggests, if anything, that Keats doesn't conform to these prescribed pronunciations. And it being the century of don'ts, we're getting, a, we're getting a wealth of information on what was actually spoken, how people actually pronounce these words. Um, um, which, well, the next question then we have to ask is, where on this sort of proto-RP received pronunciation Cockney Klein does, uh, does Keats lie? Um, and then we have to look at, um, at some of the cold hard data of his poetry itself. And that uh, involves largely his, his rhyme schemes. Um, and we think then about, well, how would Cockney in, or London, a London accent in the early 19th century have sounded and how would it have been different to now? Well, nowadays, well, well, how does Cockney sound? We drop our H's, we glottalize our T's, and so we swallow our T's, so you now I get me at and things like that. So instead of saying H at the start of hat and T at the end, I've got at. Um, well, surprisingly, actually, neither of those features are likely to have been uh, produced by Keats. H dropping hat, hat, hat for hat was definitely around at that time, but um, it was a real, very strong marker of what was perceived as lower social classes. And given Keats' background in education, he probably wouldn't have, have, have done that himself. And, and the other one, T glottaling, the uh, the glottal sound as opposed to the T in cat, fat, bat, mat, but cat, fat, bat, mat. That actually didn't arise until much later in the 19th century and into the 20th century. So Keats wouldn't have done that either. So in what way would Keats have sounded London in his day? Well, the rhyme scheme gives a massive clue, as do the, uh, the, the criticisms of the day. And one of the, one of the things he did was drop his R's, his R sounds, before consonants at the end of words. So in words like farm, he would say farm. In cart, he would say cart just like we do in present day RP. But at the time, this was picked up on and criticized by these respected periodicals. And the examples they gave were things like, oh, he rhymes thorn with fawn, how vulgar. And he rhymes sorts with thoughts, awful. Um, 
Now, of course, those sound those are perfect rhymes to, to me, possibly not to everybody here, because we may have people who speak in a, a US uh, dialect who, who have fawn, F-A-W-N, fawn and thorn. They're not rhyming there. Um, possibly people with a West Country accent. And so this tells us that Keats would have dropped his R's and he would have known he would have got criticism, but he did it anyway, which tells us a little bit, bit about Mr. Keats's uh, mindset in writing his poetry. Um, another thing that he would have done is, is which might have sounded quite London, is, is uh, the R sound, the bath bath sound. Would he say bath or bath or more like West Country bath? Well, it sounds like he would have said R and that would have sounded very London in his day. R, Bath, because he rhymes uh, in the last stanza of uh, his Ode on Indolence, he rhymes grass with farce. And we know farce would have sounded a bit like farce with a back sound, and grass is rhyming with it. Um, so this is what would have sounded London in, in his day rather than ours. Um, Roger also mentioned that he might have sounded a bit northern to, to contemporary ears. And this comes down to uh, the, the, the vowels in things like, uh, well, if I say the sentence, you, are, you have a fierce lack of gort, um, no offense to any of my, my panel members here at all, you have a fierce lack of gort in, in the northern dialect. We've got this ear sound in face, a, a, and this or sound in gort. Um, and this would have been closer to how Keats would have pronounced those face and goat vowels. Um, so in the reading that you'll hear later, we have a little bit of, uh, we, have, we have Keats um, making his O sound slightly diphthongized as that was starting back then, but um, his A sound, we've kept his A. So what does this tell us overall? Well, this gives us a picture who have, of, of a poet who's, who's proud to be of his time, linguistically speaking, and, and not backward looking. And that gives us a little insight into the mind of Mr. Keats. Oh, that's fantastic. And I think this sort of juxtaposition of, um, you know, the, the kind of social significance of, uh, of accents at the time, uh, which I think is something that we can, you know, we can relate to, uh, for better or for worse, I think we're quite accent aware, you know, accent is a, in, in the UK, particularly for a tiny country, you know, we have an awful lot of, of accent sensitivity. Um, but also, you know, it's very interesting the extent to which those sensitivities, those ideas about how you should or shouldn't speak or what the way, you know, even if you're not going to be prescriptive about it, what the way you speak tells you about where someone was from or, uh, or the, their edu likely educational background, you know, the extent to which those are shifted is really interesting, you know, it produces some, um, some big surprises. So, so um, just thinking, um, so actually, I wonder whether we should hear some some poetry. So Scarlett, would, um, should we, should we, having heard so much about Bright Star, let's hear it. Bright Star by John Keats. Bright Star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendour hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution round earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft-fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, pillowed upon my fair love's ripening breast, to feel forever its soft swell and fall, awake forever in a sweet unrest, still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death. It's really powerful stuff. Sorry, but the uh, there was a little bit of a technical glitch there at the beginning. I'm sorry about that. Don't but, worry. Uh, I think my audio is slightly low, but um, I'll try and speak up. Uh, that's... Um, that's, that's great. And the, you know, the extent to which, um, you know, I think uh, Ranjan mentioned this uh, a few minutes ago, this idea that, you know, when we think of poetry or when we are involved in poetry in any way, there are so many different ways in which it's brought to life. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things for me about the project is the juxtaposition of those ways, you know, one, the, um, the, 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 the sort of exploration of originality, you know, what the, what the words would have sounded like at the time, um, uh, with you know so many other factors like the the the, the personal meaning of poems, 
um, the, uh, the significance of the, the words to us as individuals. So, so I wonder whether we might move on. Um, so John, it's a huge pleasure to, to welcome John Simpson here to join us this evening, who really needs no uh, introduction, a, an extraordinary broadcasting legend and, and someone who not only values and understands the, the power of words, but also has used them so powerfully to convey so many, you know, in some cases easy, in some cases very, very challenging um, pieces of news to us over, uh, over, uh, over many, many Many years. So, so John, I think you, you have a poem to share with us. I thought I'd read Ode on Grecian Urn. Um, it's a famous one, uh, of course. Uh, it's full of quotes, as you might say. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I just think it might be a little bit uh, too long and too much of my voice is, uh, as the BBC knows, is uh, deeply boring. But here we go. I'll, uh, I'll read the first two verses because they are pretty fantastic. I just wish I could read it in Keats's Cockney accent, but I'm, uh, I need an awful lot of training to do that. So here he is, he's looking at, a, at an urn, a painted urn with lots of kind of classical um, uh, figures and, uh, and shapes and trees and and so on but mostly obviously nymphs and indeed no doubt shepherds and gods and goddesses and this is what we have to bear in mind he's looking at this urn and he, these are the thoughts that that go through his mind as he write, wrote them down later thou still unravished bride of quietness thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who can thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not with the sensual ear, but more endeared. Pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth beneath the trees, Thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss the winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. O oh, Attic shape! Fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity, cold pastoral. When old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man. To whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Wow. <laughs> I think there's there's something really um, there's something really special about the uh, the timelessness of that particular uh that yeah that that particular sentiment the uh i don't know Scar scarlet that was uh beautiful and beautifully read john it was uh, very commanding in your voice and i think that the last two lines are really iconic and, and much quoted and it's just it, i think that poem never loses its resonance and power 
And in fact, I think, you know, this is a poem that many poets um, have over the years um, wanted to respond to. So Ode to a Grecian Urn is, a, is an iconic poem uh, and a poem that many, many people have found meaning in. And in fact, actually, I think that we have another re reading um, along exactly those lines. Um, so Wallace Stevens's poem, the anecdote of the jar, um, which is a rather off the wall response to uh, to, to that poem. Uh, Roger, would you like to introduce that one? Uh, sure, happy to. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting poem. I mean, one of the things about uh, Keats' Ode to a Grecian Urn is the extent to which he finds uh, he finds the, the 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 human and the divine as, as, as through John's wonderful reading. You saw these 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 godlike figures. Uh, leaping off of the vase and, and 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 living in the human world, and of course, much of, of of the literature of antiquity is all about this interplay between human lives and the lives of the gods. What's very interesting about about Wallace Stevens, who is an absolutely extraordinary poet, uh, perhaps America's greatest poet of, of the 20th century, uh, an interesting guy. His friends had no idea he was a poet by and large until he won the National Book Award, and suddenly he was the best poet in America. In any event, to his poem, uh, it's an yeah. exact inversion of, of Keats' poem in a way, rather than taking this exalted object and finding uh, what's human in it, he looks at something very humble, this mayonnaise jar, and finds what is godlike in the mayonnaise jar. We have a great, it's, it's, a, it's a poem that, that Stevens wrote while he was in Tennessee. It's a poem, of, uh, as you will see, uh, about Tennessee in some ways. And we've got a, a wonderful, and to some people I think familiar, uh, voice from Nashville. Uh, who very graciously in the middle of the night last night got up and uh, and recorded this for us. So uh, with many thanks to our friend in Nashville and uh, Alexi, uh, please. Anecdote of the Jar by Wallace Stevens. I placed a jar in Tennessee and round it was upon a hill. It made the slovenly wilderness surround that hill. The wilderness rose up to it and sprawled around, no longer wild. The jar was round upon the ground, and tall, and of a port and air. It took dominion everywhere. The jar was gray and bare. It did not give of bird or bush, like nothing else in Tennessee. Fantastic. The jar was round upon the ground. I love that line. Uh, something really special about that. So, um, so should we turn to Hannah? So we, we are really privileged um, to have Hannah Sullivan here uh, to join us. Um, an extremely distinguished poet is, I think, going to give us um, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a response to uh, to Keats herself, um, and. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about the, the significance of some of these poems to, to her poetry. Um, thank you so much, Alexi. I've been really en enjoying listening to these readings. Um, the Grecian Urn Ode, I don't know if it's influenced my writing, but it was certainly the first poem that I learned off by heart on the number 65 bus, which takes a long time to get from Ealing to Richmond. Um, I'm going to read a, I think, slightly less well-known Keats poem, a poem um, that I started thinking about because it contains a mistake um, the, the title of the poem, the first line, is how many bards gild the lapses of time, a line that doesn't scan, and it's occasioned a lot of discussion um, among uh, generative metrics um, scholars, metricians. Um, actually thinking about um, Ranjan's point, there's maybe a little bit to do with pronunciation. I'm pretty sure that it shouldn't be lapses um, with the stress on the first syllable, syllable but um, elapse, um, but we could discuss that. Um, this is a poem that was written in 1816. It's sort of an early version of the better known um, poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer. What I like about it is that it gives a sense of Keats's relationship to tradition and to the poets that he loved, um, especially Spencer and Milton, that is very generous, gentle and amiable. So he says that when he sits down to start writing, all of the poets of the past throng around him and he hears their, their voices, um, but there's, there's nothing stressful about that. Um, no confusion, no disturbance, rude. Um, I really like that idea. I think it, critics of English literature spend a lot of time thinking about the anxiety of influence and the way that um, poets are locked in some sort of nightmarish struggle with their predecessors. And, um, you know, that's certainly never never been my own um, feeling. And I'm glad to see that it wasn't Keats as even as, even as a very young writer. Um, how many bards gild the elapse of time? 
How many bards gild the elapse of time? A few of them have ever been the food of my delighted fancy. I could brood over their beauties, earthly or sublime. And often when I sit me down to rhyme, these will in throngs before my mind intrude. But no confusion, no disturbance rude do they occasion, tis a pleasing chime. So the unnumbered sounds that evening store, the songs of birds, the whispering of the leaves, the voice of waters, the great bell that heaves with solemn sound and thousand others more that distance of recognizance bereaves makes pleasing music and not wild uproar. Um, from the sublime to the ridiculous, it, it feels a little bit, but I, I thought that I would um, just read a short poem um, or section of a poem from my um, collection, three poems actually. Um, so this is um, in, in a, a poem that is about repetition. Um, it's called Repeat Until Time, the Heraclitus poem. I was thinking about this section recently because it's about every day being the same. And as we live through the uh, endless, um, you know, Groundhog Day of lockdown, um, it was on my mind. But this, this section is itself a response to um, Larkin, Larkin um, saying in his little short poem, Days, what are days for? Days are where we live. And when the book was being copy edited, um, the copy editor rather objected to this because he thought I'd misunderstood um, Larkin's point and, and perhaps I had, but um, the poem is, is in, in tribute. I, I like to think of it as being in that kind of generous or sort of amiable relationship. It's not an attempt to correct the earlier, earlier poem. Um, so 2.1, days, maybe where we live, but mornings are eternity. They wake us and every day waking is absurdity. All the things you just did yesterday to do over again, eternally. The clench of tonsil on extra tonsil is an oyster only once, once the blood and itch of broken skin and afterwards indifference. The boredom of the weeping aromatic bed sores only once. But forever fumbling for the snooze button, the gym is there forever and the teeth silt over yellow to be flossed and there will be in eternity coffee to be brewed and that moment in the shower when you open your mouth and rotisize the water and just stand there, stupid bliss of hot water, tongue tingling, steaming the shower. Oh, thank you. It's really amazing, Anna. Thanks so much. I think the, the juxtaposition of those two poems is really fantastic. It's so sort of timely. I think, yeah, as you say, your own poem really speaks to the here and now. I think uh, where we're all uh, we're, we're all confined to our our Zoom rooms and our our real world, our sort of uh, our single real rooms. That's uh, really really great. It's interesting as well what you say about repetition, and uh, and also you mentioned that. You, the first poem you learned was Ode to a Grecian Urn. I have a very vivid memory of having to uh, memorize Hilaire Belloc's Tarantella, which for people that don't know, it's worth looking up. It's a, it's a very lyrical poem that uh, repeats, do you remember the inn, Miranda? Do you remember the inn? Yeah, I too uh, was sitting on the school bus with that one. So, also, sorry. I, I, also, I have to say, uh, Hannah, I mean, an extraordinary pleasure and privilege to hear you, to hear you read. That great line, there will be in eternity coffee to be brewed. It's just, it, 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 it's well, so, it, so. <laughs> but, but, yeah, absolutely, but it's, it's certainly all of a piece with the Grecian urn, the mayonnaise jar, the coffee urn, all of these vessels that are, that are, that are connecting us to the past, to the future, uh, through, through, the, through, through time. I mean, it's, it's an amazing, amazing thing, way in which I think poetry, and Keats is a great example of that, uh, connects us to the past and brings it right into the present. And people are, are finding ways still to do that. And you're a great example of that. But in any event, it's a real privilege to hear you read. I love your poetry and, uh, and hope I have a chance to hear you read some more sometime. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, one thing I, I might say about um, the way that poems feed other poems. And I think that learning poems off by heart um, you, you puts them into your mind in, in strange ways. I was struck when I was reading um, this, this little section of mine by the word indifference, which I'm sure actually um, I pinched from the wasteland, which I was teaching this morning. Um, you know, I don't think that my own poetry is very Keatsian, but there are interesting ways in which once you, you learn someone's lines and you have their rhythms in, in your mind or your interpretation of their rhythms, if you're hearing it in a, a different accent, I think they feed um, new poetry in quite surprising and unpredictable ways, um, which is partly why I like, I like Keats's images of the, 
the sounds that are all confused and muddled up together at distance of recognizance for Eves. Um, but thanks for, thanks for inviting me to take part and looking forward to hearing some more poems now. Great, thanks so much. So yeah, so let's move on to another poem. So we have uh, yet another voice here um, and, uh, and another, uh, another Keats poem. So this is uh, Keats's poem, On the Sea, uh, coming to you from um, the Honourable George Ferguson, um, so former uh, governor of Bermuda, um, and also the uh, the Pitcairn Islands. And uh, his career is is completely bound up with the sea. New Zealand, Pitcairn, Bermuda. It's all about these great seas. On the sea, it keeps eternal whisperings around desolate shores, and with its mighty swell, glats twice 10,000 caverns, till the spell of Hecate leaves them their old shadowy sound. Often tis in such gentle temper found that scarcely will the very smallest shell be moved for days from where it sometime fell, when last the winds of heaven were unbound. O ye who have your eyeballs vexed and tired, feast them upon the wideness of the sea, O ye whose ears are dinned with uproar rude, or fed too much with cloying melody, sit ye near some old cavern's mouth and brood, until ye start as if the sea nymphs cried. Super. So, um, so we might actually pair that. Let's let's move on perhaps to another voice, Lucy Page, uh, who is a very uh, a very uh, successful uh, soprano singer, um, and someone who I think thinks a lot about poetry uh, in what she sings and uh, and the way that she thinks about singing, um, has recorded a poem, uh, another Keats poem for us, on fame. So let's listen to that. On fame. Fame, like a wayward girl, will still be coy to those who woo her with two slavish knees, but makes surrender to some thoughtless boy, and dotes the more upon a heart at ease. She is a gypsy, will not speak to those who have not learnt to be content without her. A jilt, whose ear was never whispered close, who thinks they scandal her who talk about her. A very gypsy is she, Nihilus born, sister-in-law to jealous Potiphar. Ye lovesick bards, repay her scorn for scorn. Ye artists, lovelorn, madmen that ye are, make your best bow to her and bid adieu. Then, if she likes it, she will follow you. So interesting to see those two together, uh, you know, on, on something extremely physical, a poem about the sea to something that is the opposite of that, uh, a poem about fame and our relationship to it. Um, so Roger, it's I- interesting. I was gonna say, the, uh, we have several musicians among our readers tonight, and, I, and there really is something quite distinctive about the way musicians, I think, approach this. There really is a, an emphasis on the sonic, the sonic quality. On fame is particularly interesting too, because of course Keats, who, who, who aspired to fame in every possible way was something that he cared a lot about and that he never achieved during his lifetime and felt that he, that he was deprived of fame rather unfairly by critics with whom he, did, he disagreed. Uh, that poem is particularly poignant to hear. It's written fairly late at a time when he probably knew that fame was going to elude him during his lifetime. Of course, he's received it now. Hopefully he's looking down and seeing this, this 200 year legacy and appreciating that a little bit, but, uh, but it is a, it's a very poignant thing to read a poem about, to hear a poem about fame written by someone who wanted it so badly and was just, no matter what he did, not able to, to achieve it. So, um, so Roger, actually, would you like to, we're gonna hear from another voice um, and then perhaps we will um, we'll move on to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the, 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 the technical part of this project and also move towards our, our freshly commissioned poems. Um, but I think we have a, we have a final sonnet actually um, that's been, uh, that, that we're going to hear. Uh, Roger, would you like to introduce this one? Sure, it's the, it's the sonnet to Spencer uh, read uh, tonight by, by Charles Spencer, a, a truly wonderful man and uh, a, a gracious and generous friend. 
And, uh, and, I, and I have to say, there are a few people in England uh, who, who care more about or better represent English heritage than, than Charles Spencer. And so it's a real honor to have him here, a great son of Maudlin. Uh, it's a really wonderful honor to have him here tonight reading this poem written by someone who uh, uh, at least claimed to be a, uh, a, a member of the Spencer family. And as, as, as some folks have said, no one, no one challenged him at the time. And so Edmund Spencer became uh, somehow connected, uh, at least uh, through the quirks of history with, with, the, with, with, with the Spencer family. But uh, all kidding aside, it really is uh, interesting when we think about the poetical legacy of the Romantics, they are interwoven as, as intricately as they possibly could be with the fabric of, 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 of British history throughout the last 200 years. Uh, and to see somebody who, who has, he really devotes his life to preserving, remembering, writing about uh, that history, read this poem it's a it's it's an it's a very interesting moment i think and i i can't thank uh i can't thank lord spencer enough for having having taken the time to do this for us sonnet to spencer i thought of witcheries of olden days of shaggy satyrs with a cloven heel and clashing symbols of the drunken reel of bacchanals of merry-making fays of branching forests which from the sun's rays shade tender flowers where in some cool retreat they shed their hidden beauty at the feet of huge oak trees of shepherds simple lays of nymphs unseen save by their sylvan wooers of tinkling rills of courteous knights the doers of proud deeds warring with enchanters cursed and with this pleasing dream by fancy nursed then spencer did i think of thee who such tales told sounding like springs from mossy caverns old. So um, having started with, you know, a discussion about Keats' voice, we've now heard Keats in many, many different voices. And what I want to do now is just to, uh, so we're going to hear shortly from our, uh, our CGI Keats, from our computer generated uh, version of Keats produced um, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Sen, um, with colleagues uh, to whom we're very grateful at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So we've had uh, some great costume advice um, from uh, Jenny Lister at the V&A. Um, but I, what I want to do is, um, is, I suppose, before we see that, just talk a little bit um, about the technical aspects of that project to try to bring it to life uh, with a couple of slides. So let me pull those up now, just to give you some idea of what we were, uh, what, how, how this worked in terms of the, the physical uh, reconstruction of the man. Okay, hopefully people can see that now. So um, uh, Dr. Sen has already talked about how, um, you know, we have a detective, we have some detective work to do in terms of the, um, the, the accent uh, that Keats would have spoken with. The same is true of his physical appearance. So the, uh, unfortunately Keats was a few decades late uh, to, uh, to make it into any photographs. Um, what we do have um, as records of his appearance are a number of fairly consistent paintings. Uh, so you see these on the slide here, um, a couple of pictures here that were painted um, during Keats's lifetime and also posthumously by uh, the painter and his friend, Joseph Seven. Um, and what we also have are death and life masks of Keats. Um, so you can see on this slide here, uh, the left hand side shows a life mask uh, of Keats taken during his lifetime, the right hand side a death mask uh, shortly after he died. So what we've been able to do is to use the structural information that we have from the, uh, the, the, the masks. So that gives us uh, details like, of course, the proportions of his face, um, the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the, uh, it gives us a good idea of the, um, the strength of the sort of bony features of his face. You can see that we get a really good idea, for example, of what his nose would have been like. We've been able to combine that with uh, the rather flimsier, but nonetheless, I think, important evidence from these uh, paintings and drawings to come up with uh, what we hope is a good approximation uh, to what he might have looked like. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, uh, we've also turned to uh, our colleagues at the V&A, in particular uh, Jenny Lister, who is an expert in uh, the fashions of that particular time to give us some idea uh, of the kind of clothing um, that Keats and his contemporaries would have been wearing uh, in Rome at the beginning of the, uh, the 19th century. 
Um, so, uh, so I'll show you this before we actually see the, the full model. This gives you some idea of what we have um, as sort of technicians to play with. So what we're able to do is to create uh, a, a, a mesh that describes the face, uh, which is generated by using the data from the uh, from the from the masks, from the uh, well, the combination of the mask and the and the the pictures. Uh, so we're able to define his features, um, and then we're able to um, actually bring that to life, literally. So we can animate those structures in a way that's natural uh, for the face. Um, and what we end up with is a, a, a kind of walking, talking rendition, um, which incorporates uh, these, these clues that we have about the man's physiology taken from those sources. So um, what I think we should do now is let me stop sharing my screen now, um, get the technology to to work with me, that's great. So what I want to do now is to, uh, to introduce our new poems. So as we mentioned at the beginning of the session, um, we have, we're really excited actually to have two new poems um, being commissioned uh, and produced for this project. Um, one from Scarlett um, and one from uh, Simon Armitage, people uh, may know as our, as our poet laureate. Two very different poems, um, but two poems that really capture um, the, uh, the, the, I think what we're trying to achieve here, the um, a, a sort of, a, sort of a, a contemplation um, about Keats um, as a man um, and as a poet. So I don't know, Scarlett, would you like to introduce your poem? Do you want to say a little bit about your, your poem and its inspiration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be taking part in today's commemoration and to have been, you know, appointed for, to, you know, write a poem especially and to do so with our incredible poet, Gloria Simon Armitage. And there's a brief introduction to my pre recorded poem, but I was really struck with um, the tumultuous times we keep living in. Uh, there were food riots. Uh, I, I read that uh, I think there's around 20 members of parliament committed suicide um, during the time Keats was alive over a decade or two, and and it was uh, it was it was tumultuous. And of course, Keats passed away from tuberculosis, as had his brother and his mother and his father, who died in an accident. So, I think in writing this poem. I'm going to share with all of you. Um, I realized how death and loss was so apparent to him. And I think we've all in the past year been faced with our own mortality and an increased gratitude for, you know, health and the health of our families. And I think I captured that. And I also was really intrigued to discover that Keats had worked as a surgeon's dresser. He started medical training when he was about 15. And he trained as an apothecary, and he eventually he didn't fully complete his medical studies because he felt the vocation to poetry and, and wanted to pursue that, obviously. Um, but it really struck me that this was a man who made his life with his hands and the mind he had that could work, you know, in the medical field and also crafting these beautiful poems. And I think the beauty and sensuality of these poems is all the more all the more powerful and moving knowing now more about his life and what he lived through so um, that's what i tried to capture in this poem and the last lines of my poem are the present day of, of me when i was contemplating his death mask and, and the kind of incredible intimacy in seeing it and, and the you know, the, the lines of the space that were captured. And um, I was just, I'm just, you know, such a fan of his work and very moved. And, you know, it's, although he didn't achieve the fame he wanted in his lifetime, I think it's such a testament to him and his work that, you know, 200 years later, we're all gathered here today for him. So I hope wherever he is, he can feel that and appreciate that. Um, so, yes. <laughs> So this poem is called the 23rd of February, 1821, Remembering John Keats. Body and flesh a compass for an isle fervent with dissent. Your mind's eye perform mercilessly 
and his scalp and pen. And in between the gasps and screams, your lungs exhaled beauty and dreams. Your hands and fingers insistent, conjuring invocations of blood and love. You clutched her neck as you stood before the precipice of death, blasphemy beneath the church steps. And now the hand that once burnished her flesh clutches your chest, exhaling blood-red breath. And now I gaze at the death mask cast as you passed away. I trace your eyelids' delicate crease, wondering at the imprint your lips leave. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, it was... Uh... Yeah, it's just, it's been a real pleasure to take part in and to write that poem. And I've, I've just been feeling very connected to him and his, his life and work. Now that's wonderful. Roger, would you, um, do you want to respond to that? I just want to say, I mean, Carl's poem to me was, was a real transformation of this, of this project for me. I actually, I, I have one of the death masks and, and, I, and I, you hold it in your hands and it's, it's, a, it's a completely sort of, you know, it's sort of a, a, a a bit macabre, and it's a, but it's it's a it's a fairly mundane physical object, and and reading Scarlett's poem and those that, those final the final words of it, and and, and, to, and to see how a physical object can be transformed by by feeling by emotion, it, it puts you in mind of the mayonnaise jar of the coffee urn in, in Hannah's poem of the of of the Grecian urn in in, in, in Keats' poem. I mean these phys, these physical objects are just objects, but we can imbue them with uh, with 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 heroic qualities that we all aspire to. Uh, and so I think it's just it's just a, it's just a very interesting thing this this interplay between the the physical the permanent and the and the the ephemeral that can sometimes inhabit the physical it was such a huge part of the romantic idiom this idea of, of the the ruin that was somehow inhabited by these this this this, this sense of fatalism that, that dominated so much of the romantic sport these were physical objects very much like the the, the monuments that, that that we build in our other life at the Institute for Digital Archaeology that are nonetheless somehow imbued with history with emotion uh, and with a kind of Stoicism. So anyway, it, it's, I was really, I, I thought Scarlett did just such an amazing job uh, pr producing a poem for, for this project that I think will also, um, and, and I'll, I'll, say, I'll say now in terms of Simon's poem, I think he accomplished many of the same things, uh, but the two of them together provided, I think, wonderful grist for uh, the, the last member of our team, the fellow who's not here tonight. He's not working on poetry, uh, but the Grecian urn is sort of the central image and the central motif and the central focus in a lot of ways of this bicentennial celebration. And one of the great things that will come out of it, and you'll, the world will see it this summer, is a marvelous new Grecian urn for the 21st century produced by a fantastic ceramic artist, a painter, uh, slash ceramic artist Dan Baldwin, uh, who, uh, whose, whose works are exhibited in, in London at the Maddox Gallery and all around the world, uh, but a really uh, extraordinary, sensitive uh, fellow who has a great feel for the, uh, for the poetry of the Romantics. And Scarlett and Simon both uh, have managed to give him a lot of wonderful iconography to work with. So my name is Dan Baldwin, and I am a British artist. Um, it's a huge honour to be invited into this project to uh, work with two amazing poets on this pot. I'm working on a big pot, a 95 centimetre pot, in homage of the bicentennial of uh, Keats's death. What an amazing life, what a tragic life, what a fascinating young man who changed the face of British poetry. Um, Simon Armitage has shown me a piece he's written and it's absolutely incredible and I'm waiting to, to speak to Scarlett about her piece and somehow amalgamate the two into my piece. So we've got three artists working together on one piece and this overall project is incredibly exciting so thank you for inviting me in and uh, I look forward to seeing how it pans out. Um, Simon's poem is next. Simon Armitage, the, the poet laureate of the United Kingdom. I mean, this fellow is the successor to, to Tennyson and to Wordsworth. And Simon Armitage, as the inheritor of this title, is a great uh, exponent of it. Uh, and the poem that he's produced for us, I think, is, is interesting. What I would suggest you listen for uh, is the 
is the kind of rhythms of the poem, the language of the poem, his own Northern accent and thinking about that. Uh, as you think about the, the Keats poem that comes at the end, there's a connection between, there's a connection there that I think is interesting. What's also what I love about uh, Simon's poem is it gives us a new chiasmus, that, that, that wonderful line that encircles the pot in, 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 in Keats' poem, beauty is, beauty is, truth is beauty and beauty truth, that is all we know on earth and all we need to know. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful concept, this, this, this idea of the chiasmus of something turning over on itself, uh, beauty truth and truth beauty, it really makes you think about the words in a particular way. Uh, Mr. Armitage has done very much the same thing at the end of his poem, produced a, a different kind of chiasmus, a chiasmus that I think is very apropos to the, to the, to the, the times we're living in. So those are a few of the things you might want to listen for, but mostly just listen to the sound of the poem. It's beautiful and it's especially beautiful, uh, read by, by Mr. Armitage. I speak as someone whose skin was thinner than gold leaf, with a soul so porous the world blew through him in a light breeze, whose coffin landed his heart in his palm many times. And as someone who sailed the panicky seas of his own blood, in Naples harbour, the summer served its ten-day quarantine below deck till the air wasn't fit to drink. Now bats roost in the plush colonnades of human veins and naked arms are offered up to the dewy-eyed syringe. So my tired hand must hover over the seance again to write No life without death, no death without life just semaphore flags and fragile bottles bobbing from coast to coast, freighted with ink and breath. Extremely evocative. Um, and uh, and it's, it's hard not to draw the parallels. I think having heard both of those poems between, uh, you know, the kind of the challenge of the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in now and the, the challenges associated with the, you know, the global pandemic really that was uh, TB at the time of at the time of Keats. So, so, um, so now I think we'll move on to um, to uh, a, a reading from our CGI uh, rendition of Keats. Uh, so, Keats is going to read Bright Star, his uh, final poem, and indeed the poem that we started uh, today with uh, with Scarlett's powerful reading. The voice has been um, provided or has been constructed uh, using the, uh, the, the detective work that Dr. Sen uh, described so engagingly at the beginning of this session. Um, and currently uh, we're, we are, we're sort of in the process of expanding um, uh, Keats's repertoire. So over the course of this, uh, this year long celebration of Keats's life, uh, we hope to, uh, to, to add to his capabilities um, and improve him as we go along. So, uh, so I will hand over to him. Unless Roger, would you like to say anything ahead of that? We're very, we're very fortunate to have um, Mr. Mark Kudish providing the, uh, the voice for John Keats. Uh, Mark Kudish is a true Broadway legend. Uh, I don't know how many Tony Awards he's, uh, he's been nominated for over the years, has had leading roles in, 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 in too many plays to count. Uh, television, Hollywood. Uh, Mark Kudish is is a is is a, one of the great uh, standard bearers for everything that's good about Broadway and everything that's good about theater in America. So we're really really thrilled to have uh, his incredible talent uh, being uh, brought to bear on this project under the tutelage of uh, of Dr. Sen. So uh, big thanks to Mark, and I hope you enjoy this. This is uh, to me the moment when Keats' poetry locked in and became something that I could really understand and relate to was when I heard was when I heard it voiced in this way as it would have sounded inside the head of John Keats 200 years ago. I should say that we're seeing uh, John Keats uh, in a live feed from the, uh, from the very room in which he passed away in the Keats house um, in Rome. The, the, uh, the security camera is doing the work there for us, uh, but uh, in the event, many, many thanks to uh, uh, Giuseppe Albino and all the folks at the at the Keats House uh, in Rome. They've done a spectacular job uh, with this uh, celebrating this bicentennial and have been great partners to work with uh, on this project. And I guess they'll be tucking in uh, Mr. Keats tonight when he spends that 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 last night in his bed uh, at the foot of the Spanish Steps. Uh, so anyway, I hope you enjoy this. It's been the, the product of, and I did say Dr. Karanowska has has been very modest about her role in all of this. She has been the the technical guru who has made all of this happen. 
uh, and there, there are lots of, of sous chefs here, but there's only one master chef, and that's and that's Dr. Karanowska, and she has, uh, I think, made made real magic happen uh, with this uh, with this with the CGI, and it's something that we plan to carry forward. I should also say that uh, this is still a work in progress. We still have improvements to make on the wardrobe. We still have improvements, I think, to make. Uh, on lots of aspects of this, but it really is something that to me um, is quite powerful and, and, and brings the poetry alive in a very special way. And, uh, and I, hope, I hope Mr. Keats, wherever he is, is, is pleased. Uh, so thanks to everybody who participated. See what you think. <laughs> Here we go. Bright star, would I were steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor hung aloft the night and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite. The moving waters at their priest-like task of pure ablution roamed earth's human shores, or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon the mountains and the moors. No, yet still steadfast, still unchangeable, Pillowed upon me fair love's ripening breast, To feel forever its soft fall in swell, Awake forever in a sweet unrest. Still, still to hear her tender taken breath, And so live ever, or else swoon to death. Still, still to hear her tender taken breath, and so live ever, or else swoon to death.